Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 Saki and Michael Doctoral Memorial Lecture. This event honours their shared contribution to the study of international history and the pivotal role they both played in the development of the Department of War Studies as a world-class academic department specialising in both strategic and security studies. And both Mike and Saki also taught in the early years of the Defence Studies Department. Let me briefly explain uh, the format for this evening. Uh, we will hear from our distinguished guest speaker, followed by an opportunity for questions, and there will then be a reception to which you are all cordially invited. But before we move on to our main event, a number of Mike and Saki's friends have asked that we pause for a moment to remember Professor Keith Hamilton, who suddenly passed away in October this year. After completing his PhD, Keith Hamilton took an academic post at the University College of Wales, Aberystwyth. In 1990, he became the first external academic to be recruited as a full-time editor by the historical branch of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. After his retirement from the FCO, he took a visiting professorship at King's, where he proved to be a brilliant supervisor and mentor to the doctoral students he co-supervised with uh, Dr. Michael Kandaya. A, a prolific author, he was one of the greats of international history. Yet, despite his many achievements, he remained a modest and extremely approachable man. Keith was a very close friend of both Mike and Saki's. He will be sorely missed, and our thoughts and sympathies are with his wife, Cathy, who was a librarian here at King's. Now, with that appropriate pause to remember one colleague uh, of the doctorals, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, who was a close friend of Saki's and knew both of the doctorals very well. Our distinguished speaker is Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at Keele University. An alumna of Clare College, Cambridge and Queen Mary College, London, she has previously taught at the LSE before joining Keele. Her research interests are many and varied, including Britain's relations with the European community, the Labour Party and European integration, Britain's nuclear weapons policy and Anglo-French relations. She is a prolific author whose work has received many accolades. And her most recent book uh, about the Falklands War, Our Boys, the Story of a Paratrooper, won not only the Templar Medal Book Prize uh, and the Wellington Medal for Military History, but also the Longman History Today Book Prize, and was long listed for the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. Phew. She is currently uh, a British Academy and Lever Hume Senior Research Fellow, and it is her work on this project which informs the subject of her lecture tonight. Our speaker will address uh, the subject Remembering Death in British Military Campaigns from Korea and Malaya to Iraq and Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure. Please join with me in welcoming Professor Helen Parr. Thank you so much for the incredibly uh, generous uh, introduction and um, thank you so much also for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, I really do feel honoured to be here. Um, I remember Mike and Saki uh, very fondly from when I was a PhD student uh, because they were both so encouraging and friendly. Uh, they always seemed to attend events where PhD students were present um, and they really were always very encouraging just by their presence. So it's, it's quite remarkable to be here. I couldn't possibly ever have anticipated it then, and that's, it's sad that they're no longer with us. Um, and thank you also for coming to, to listen to the talk. So I want to start with some images with which I'm sure we're all familiar. The British Military Cemetery at Etape near Boulogne the largest of the Imperial War Grave Commission cemeteries in France. Men in Gate at Ypres opened in 1927, 
on which were engraved the names of 55,000 British Empire soldiers who had no known graves. And the memorial to the missing on the Somme at Thiepval, unveil unveiled in 1932, on which 72,000 names were carved, and the cemetery below, where there are 300 graves of French and British soldiers. The French graves a simple cross marked with the word inconnu, and the British with details where they were known, and the phrase proposed by Rudyard Kipling, known unto God. And here we have the cenotaph, unveiled in stone on Armistice Day in 1920, designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens. It's designed reflecting the absence of bodies, literally the empty tomb, and which inspired thousands of local war memorials on which the names of the dead locally were inscribed. And the unknown warrior lying in Westminster Abbey, whose body it was genuinely was unknown. On 9th of November 1920, six bodies were exhumed from six different battle sites in Northern Europe. The bodies were taken to Ypres and a blindfolded officer selected one of the coffins. The coffin was taken past the cenotaph and interred in Westminster Abbey. A million and a quarter British people visited the tomb within a week, many in the hope and belief that the body might be that of their own son, husband or brother. So, as we know, the Great War shaped and defined how Britons remembered war. The scale of death was huge. By the time the war ended in 1918, 772,000 men who had fought for the British forces had been killed. And at the heart of the commemorative practices was the Imperial War Grave Commission and the government's decision not to repatriate bodies. That decision was always disputed. Influential people like Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, former Prime Minister Herbert Asquith and Secretary of State for War Winston Churchill disagreed with it. They wanted both to bring back the bodies if the families requested it and to allow headstones of the families choosing. The Countess of Selborne, a conservative suffragist, wrote in an article entitled National Socialism of War Cemeteries that the absolute uniformity of the cemeteries was the end of individual freedom. She said, the conscription of bodies is worthy of Lenin in its contempt of liberty and exaltation of the state. However, the views of the newly formed Imperial War Graves Commission, headed by Brigadier General Sir Fabian Ware, prevailed. Ware, initially head of a Red Cross unit, took great care to itemise and record details of every death. He maintained that British men should be buried where they had fallen, together with the men with whom they had served. They had died for their country together, and therefore they were equal in sacrifice. For where this was a remarkable democratisation of death in military service. It helped to mask some horrible divisions. If re repatriation had been permitted, the families of wealthy servicemen would be able to pay for respectable or lavish burials, and the families of the poor could not. Bodies would be, be returned to be buried, as so many had been before the war, in paupers' graves, some of them unmarked. Bringing home the bodies could also reveal which men had been too badly injured to be identified, and those whose bodies had been eviscerated. Some families would have a body to mourn, and others nothing. Ware also believed that cemeteries should be uniform. Each headstone was to be an identical size and shape, with a regimental emblem and a religious symbol most commonly the Christian cross. Where next of kin were established, families could pay to have a very small additional inscription. There was to be no profusion of allowing families to put up unsuitable effigies in cemeteries, as Sir Lionel Earl, the permanent secretary at the Ministry of Works, put it. The military cemetery showed that the men had died fighting to defend the British Empire in service of crown and country. Sir Frederick Kenyon, the director of the British Museum, reported to the commission that the lines of headstones represented the order and discipline that was at the heart of the British Army. He saw the British military cemetery overseas as the enduring symbol of Britain's global reach, centred on an idea of a pastoral, Christian, timeless England. In 1914, the poet Robert Brooke wrote, if I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. Forever England. <laughs>
The care of the bodies of the dead helped to remake an idea of British civilization after the war, and the care of the bodies could be seen as a dividing line between civilization and barbarism. Of course, there were exclusions in the democratization. As Michelle Barrett and others have shown, although Fabian Ware argued for the equal identification of African troops, the colonial office considered Africans not to need individual recognition. That was not only because of race, but because they were seen to be pagan or heathen rather than Christian. Their resting places, therefore, were allowed to revert to nature. And at the war memorial in Basra, Mesopotamia, now Iraq, the main place where troops from the Indian army died, the colonial office named the, the officers as individuals, but not the 33,000 men in the other ranks. And so, as Thomas Lecoeur argues, the memorialization of the First World War was created alongside the modern British nation. The tomb of the unknown warrior and the fact that there must have been mistakes made in the reburial of bodies in military cemeteries after the war, but everybody behaved as if they were not, represented, Lecoeur said, a magic we can believe in. They did not, in 1919, anticipate that the Great War would not be the war to end all wars, and that 20 years later, Britain would be forced into another, even more cataclysmic war, in which 50 million people were killed worldwide, more than half of them civilians. But in fact, for Britain, the death toll in the Second World War was not as high as in the first, not nearly as high as in the first. 63,635 civilians were killed, mainly in air raids during the Blitz between September 1940 and May 1941. And 264,443 members of the armed forces, the women's auxiliary services and the merchant navy were killed in action. For Britain, the relatively low death toll and the fact that defeating Nazi Germany was unequivocally good meant that the British government saw no need to revisit the forms of commemoration already created. The dead of the Second World War were added to the memorials of the First. An Armistice Day was recreated as Remembrance Day to remember the dead of both world wars. As Lucy Noakes has argued, death, while still pre present, began to disappear. It was not as central to the aftermath of the Second World War as it has been in the First. And it was not the defining British experience of the war. That was ultimate victory over Nazism. Hence, mourning and the deaths from military violence that caused it became almost taboo and stoicism in the face of adversity was expected. And so that introduction brings me to the subject of the lecture, the memorialization of death in British mil military service after 1945. After 1945, military death was obviously nowhere near as prominent as it had been, and yet, in that period, British forces were almost continually committed to operations, and it was also a time in which Britain's world role and British society have significantly changed. So what I'm going to trace in the lecture, in perhaps a somewhat fragmented way, as the research is still in its early days and the evidence base is therefore a bit mixed, is how memorialization of death changed in the conflicts in Korea and Malaya the Falklands and the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I'll discuss some of the implications of those changes. So, the Korean War and the Malayan emergency were very different conflicts, although both resulted from the developing Cold War and the threat of communism and Malaya from the anticipated end of the British Empire. And both occurred during a time of conscription in Britain, Korea between 1950 and 1953, and Malaya from 1948 until 1960. Of all the wars of Cold War and end of, and end of Empire, only Korea was, for British servicemen, anything like a war of death. In Korea, 1,106 British servicemen were killed, and the hostile weather and terrain, the desperate poverty of the country, 
the renowned brutality of the North Koreans and the awful conditions of some of the fighting meant that many servicemen, perhaps particularly national servicemen, did not want to be posted there. So there's a photo of roll call of survivors of the Gloucestershire Regiment after the Battle of Injin River in 1951. And given what they'd been through, they look surprisingly cheerful. D.F. Barrett, National Serviceman D.F. Barrett, arriving in Korea in September 1950, wrote in his diary, at full light, the source of the strong smell of rotting flesh is self-evident, coming as it does from bodies buried in shallow graves all over our hill, some of which have been partly exposed by the heavy rain. Hands, feet, and the occasional head are springing up like corn all over the hillside, coupled with lumps of flesh that was once a man. National Service Officer John Hollands called his autobiographical novel The Dead, the Dying, and the Damned. And Sir Peter Holmes recalled the horrible death of an officer hit by shrapnel, whose body seemed to stand up for ages with blood spouting, and the six-hour death of Corporal F whose stomach had been blown away by a grenade. Private soldier Jim Grundy, interviewed many years later by the military history web website Legacy, recalled that he had been tasked with collecting the bodies of the dead from the battlefields. It was, he said, heartbreaking. The North Koreans often used to take the dog tags, and so sometimes it was hard to identify bodies, but they tried. And the team of three he worked in, um, they told themselves they were doing a good job. The first body he found had been sat up. It was winter and he was frozen solid. They had to use a spade to chip him away from the tree. In the summer, uh, Grundy said, they found three bodies because gas bubbles coming through the water in the rice fields and one lad's body who'd been eaten by wild dogs. The work he had to do haunted him for the rest of his life. It struck me at night that some mother's son, a brother, an uncle or a nephew, you couldn't name them. You couldn't do anything about it. And in Korea, uh, British forces were uh, buried in the United Nations um, Cemetery um, in Busan. Uh, and there's a photograph from the early days of, of that cemetery. So Malaya was a different experience, I think. So there's a rather general photograph of patrols in, in Malaya. In October 1951, the British High Commissioner was assassinated in an ambush, and a few weeks later, 11 platoon of D Company of the Royal West Kent Regiment were also ambushed, and an officer, 10 men from the ranks, and two Iban trackers were killed. One man recalled arriving on the scene to find dead lying in all sorts of twisted positions. There were pieces of hair and skin and bones stuck to the side of the truck, and the truck itself was like a sieve. But after 1951, the death of British servicemen who were killed in action was more intermittent. It's actually difficult to establish exactly how many, but it's between 300 and 500 across the period, 111 of whom uh, were national servicemen. As Richard Vinan observes, Malaya was usually seen as a good war, as unless they were sent out on patrol, servicemen were not usually in danger, or might be more in danger from the jungle than from the, from the insurgents. Leslie Thomas's novel, The Virgin Soldiers, sold four million copies worldwide, and it summed up the sense of Malaya as an exotic location, as it took a group of national servicemen through the boredom, alcohol, sex, swimming, and occasional desperate violence. I bought a second-hand copy of The Virgin Soldiers, and when I opened it, it fell open at the page at the point at which a drunk young woman who was the daughter of a socially climbing bully in the form of the regimental sergeant major was about to get into bed with a socially inferior sergeant and she was consoling him uh, that he didn't need to worry about the fact that he was uh, in her father's house because we have to do this because my father thinks I'm a lesbian. The only joke in the lecture, <laughs> for which I thought the rest of it is very sombre. Um, so in memoir and oral history interviews concerning Malaya, men seem to talk more about the challenge of having to kill than the fear of their own deaths. Killing was often close up, they could see who they had killed, and they sometimes had to carry the bodies out of the jungle after patrol. Platoon commander Raymond Hans in the Suffolk Regiment described this as unpleasant and hard work. 
If a British man were killed, his body would be taken away from the patrol and buried in a military cemetery. It was up to the officer to write a condolence letter to the parents, and sometimes possessions were returned. The officer, Geoffrey Barnes, remembered going through the possessions of one of his private soldiers to ensure that nothing was sent back that might distress his family. In 1966, British authorities decided to consolidate the remains of servicemen who were currently located in 16 cemeteries in Malaya into five main cemeteries. British forces would ultimately leave Malaya, and in view of the arrangements for the long-term care of the graves, they wanted to concentrate the remains to ensure that the graves would be perpetually maintained. The War Office wrote to Next of Kin to notify of the move, but they stressed that the Ministry of Defence has stated that the consent of Next of Kin is not being sought, and the transfer of remains is not to be held up because of advice to Next of Kin. Further, they said they would not inform the Next of Kin of Gurkhas, but that records of reinterment were to be held by the records office in the Brigade of Gurkhas in case of subsequent inquiry of next of kin. They didn't elaborate, so it's hard to know why that was the case, but the different treatment of the Gurkhas who were deployed throughout the campaign does sit a little uneasily. In response to correspondence received from family members, the War Office agreed to cremate bodies and send home ashes if families requested it, and they agreed to send photographs of the new head headstones. And Mrs. Ryan wrote in to the uh, War Office. She had misunderstood the notification to mean that her son had not previously been buried in a military cemetery. Nevertheless, her letter is a, as a sort of testament to her despair. She said, I should like to know why my son could not have been cremated at the time of his death and his ashes sent to me. I could have arranged for them to be buried in the crematorium near my home where his father has been cremated. It's too late now. I have no money to spare. I thought I could have saved the ashes and have them buried along with mine when I pass away. I don't care what I suggest. The war office will have this, this their own way. I am fed up, sick and tired with worry. You take my son away from me. And then, after 10 years' time, I find out he was not buried in a military cemetery. It's disgusting. The War Office replied to explain that he had been buried in a military cemetery. Nevertheless, her letter indicates her pain and also suggests her sense of powerlessness against the administration. So this was a period in which individuals were not encouraged to talk openly about grief. One woman, who was three when her father was killed in Korea uh, in 1953, said that she knew virtually nothing about him. Her mother was distraught, and her mother's parents arrived to help to take care of the children. The woman, now in her 70s, was instructed by her grandparents never to mention her father or ask any questions about him for fear of upsetting her mother. She said they used to tell her, don't upset your mum, she's had enough troubles. She said she was the only child at her school who did not have a father, and she said that not knowing left a huge void in her life. So, to conclude these fragments from Korea and Malaya with three thoughts. First, the Imperial War Graves Commission became the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in March 1960, as Britain's empire ended. However, the consolidation of the dead into the five military cemeteries in Malaya illustrated the War Office's conception of Britain as a world power. It did not need to consult with next of kin, because that would slow down the work of the British authorities. As empire became commonwealth, therefore, assumptions of Britain's global responsibilities remained central to Britain's self-perception. And this placed distance between the British administration of the military dead and the families affected by those operations. Relatives kept their grief private, even within families, and the little evidence gathered so far strongly suggests that military death disappeared even further during this period. Secondly, it seems that there was almost no space for the expression of public grief, nor much public recognition of death in these conflicts outside of regiments or military units. One father, who had himself been in the army, wrote to the War Office in 1961 to ask whether, on Remembrance Sunday, the government could lay a wreath for those, for those lost in the Korean War. His son had been killed there in that awful valley. <clears throat> 
Lieutenant Colonel P. L. Binns replied that the annual service at the Cenotaph was not the appropriate occasion for the laying of wreaths connected to Korea. He said that the Cenotaph is a national monument commemorating those who lost their lives in the 1914-18 war and subsequently those who fell in the 1939-1945 war. The father replied, are those who died in Korea to be forgotten as being unworthy of remembrance? In 1978, the Home Office summarised that the Cenotaph cer ceremony stands as an annual public recognition by the country of those who gave their lives for the country in the two world wars and that for such people, the ceremony might lose much of its impact if it had to cover a wider theme. If a change seemed to lessen the commemoration of those who died in the two world wars, this could likely be controversial. And thirdly, the men who fought in Korea and Malaya, at least national servicemen, did not, on the face of it, seem particularly enthusiastic about the endeavour. There does not seem to have been a zealous sense of believing in the global war against communism, for example, nor desire to extend or prolong the reach of the British Empire. Many men did not know where Korea was, were perturbed to discover that the far larger American forces often did not realise the British were there, and many men recognised that Malaya would become independent. Therefore, the roots of British military service, at least in this time of conscription, seem to have been domestic, based in men's knowledge that their grandfathers, fathers, older brothers, friends and neighbours had fought in the world wars, or had also had to do national service. Experience and remembrance of these wars of Cold War and End of Empire, therefore, was both shaped by and almost totally overshadowed by the magnitude of the two world wars. And while the Second World War was so proximate, a fundamental reassessment of Britain's world position did not take place, although that position was obviously changing. Britain's global role was assumed to be ever-present, despite knowledge that it was not. So, fast forward then to the Falklands War in 1982. It's easy to forget that when the Argentines invaded East Falkland and raised the Argentine flag at Government House, it was a terrible failure for, for Britain. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, resigned to take the blame for allowing such a humiliating oversight, and Margaret Thatcher's Prime Ministership hung in the balance. Michael Foote, the leader of the Labour Party in the House of Commons on Saturday, 3rd of April, recalled that in the Second World War, Britain had learned it should not appease a dictator and that the people of the Falkland Islands should be able to look to Britain in this moment of their desperate plight. There was therefore cross-party agreement when the fleet began to sail. And this photo shows uh, three commando brigades setting sail from Southampton on the Canberra on the 9th of April. Like men sent to Korea, most soldiers did not know where the Falkland Islands were before they set off. However, most men in this now all-professional British Army were glad to go and believed in the task that they were asked to carry out. A Lieutenant Colonel of the Royal Marines said at the time, I have never known the men so enthusiastic, motivated and with such high morale. These young men did not believe that they were likely to die. Their training in regiments like the Parachute Regiment and the Marines had, dis had instilled in them a tremendous confidence. They often welcomed the prospect of being tested and being able to prove themselves in battle. Private Worrell of the Parachute Regiment, interviewed by a senior officer after the conflict, said that on the start lines he felt terrific. I always wanted to do it. I always wanted to kill. I wanted to be a soldier. When they were confronted with the deaths of comrades, therefore, it came as a shock. Watching ships being hit in San Carlos Bay, one soldier remarked, we watched it burning all night. We were a bit shattered. We realized there are men in there dying. Actually, that's a photograph of the parachute regiment on Sussex Mountains from where they were watching the, uh, they could see what was happening in San Carlos Bay. Another man said, it will never leave me. I can see it burning now. It's always going to be imprinted there. You can't do anything. You can't help them. After two men in his patrol were shot and killed at Goose Green, a 19-year-old lieutenant said, it might sound rather naive to say so, but until then, we were quite gung-ho and confident that death would only happen to someone else. The close quarters nature of some of the fighting 
also meant that they could not escape seeing what artillery could do to the human body. One lance corporal recalled seeing a body convulsing on the ground. The artillery shell had landed right close to him. The blast had gone up, and al an artillery shell at that range, I found out to my horror, it takes off everything that was showing. He had no hands, his face was completely missing. It was horrible, absolutely horrible, and it was etched in my mind. And after the battle was over, they had to collect the bodies of their comrades, and that could also leave a lasting legacy. One man said, it took four or five of us to put him in a body bag. His legs were like pulp. The skin was still, but there was nothing there. That's one little experience. So these were not death scapes like the First World War. 255 British service personnel were killed during the Falklands War, 174 of them at sea. But the close-knit regimental system meant that those who survived talk frequently about the death of individual comrades. As death in military service for the British had become comparatively rarer, comrades felt responsibility to remember the names of those who had died. After the conflict was over, Mrs Thatcher overturned decades-long military and government policy and agreed that the bodies of those soldiers who had fallen on land could be repatriated for families who requested it. She did so only partly because families wrote to ask for it. A small number of families felt that the bodies belonged to them, not to the military. Others felt more simply that the Falkland Islands were a long way away and it would be impossible for them to visit the graves. Others did not know what to think, but they didn't want their sons to be left if the other bodies came home. The main pressure to change the policy came from members of the public who wrote to the government in quite large numbers. It seems that many people had seen footage shown on the BBC after the conflict of the temporary burial of paratroopers after the body of Goose Green, at the Battle of Goose Green, and they thought that that was the final resting place of those paratroopers, and they didn't think that it was fitting, so they wrote to the government about it. And the tabloid press took up the call to repatriate and were also vocal in their support of favourable treatment for forces families. And Mrs Thatcher, I think, instinctively sympathised with family members, and she didn't want any grounds to grow for criticism of the prosecution of the war. So Whitehall assessed that the cost of the repatriation would not be that high. They said that while the policy could uh, surface a division between those who died on, uh, at sea, whose bodies obviously could not be recovered, and those who died on land, families already knew what had happened to their relatives. Nobody was missing, presumed dead. This decision signalled an enormous change in the iconography of military death, probably greater than people realised at the time. The change in policy had not been anticipated before the conflict, and so bodies did not come home until late November, uh, six months after the end of the war, as it took time for exhumation, embalming and return. There was no ceremony when the ship carrying the bodies docked at Southampton. A lone piper played a lament on the quayside, and then bodies were taken mainly to local undertakers. Most were buried in local churchyards, and most, um, like my uncle, he was a private in the parachute regiment who was killed in the Falklands. And this photo is um, from his funeral. And you can see the coffin is actually carried on a gun carriage and pulled through the, the streets of Alton Broad, the small town where in East Anglia where, where he lived. It's a really impressive spectacle. It's a really impressive military spectacle brought into civilian settings. And then the funeral... Uh, uh, there's a, 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 a gun salute. I don't think they use gun carriages anymore to transport the, the, the coffins. Uh, it's interesting that, that they did in 1982. So most people chose, uh, even when the bodies were buried in, uh, in civilian churchyards, most people chose to have them buried with full military honours. So did repatriation of bodies something many families had argued for since 1914, affect the ways that families experienced grief? That is not an easy question. One 
brother remembered his father standing by the coffin at the undertaker's and howling, it's just a box. And I remember as a child at the undertaker's by my uncle's coffin uh, with my father and other uncle angry that they just didn't know what was inside the coffin. Many people commented that other people did not know how to talk to them. Frieda McKay, the mother of Ian McKay, who won the Victoria Cross after being killed on Mount Longdon, said that grief was like entering a long, dark tunnel and that people often crossed the street to avoid her because they didn't know what to say. I read a recent interview with Ian McKay's daughter, Melanie, who was three when he died, and she said that as a child, she didn't fully understand she would never see her father again. She said she suppressed her grief and was only coming to terms with it now. She said she had longed to be part of a normal 2.4 children family. And that sentiment strikes me as being not dissimilar from the Korean War daughter I mentioned earlier. But others did say that bringing the bodies home gave a form of closure. One father said, it's a terrible thing. One of the reasons closure came better when the bodies were brought back home, because you had something tangible. You had a body and you laid him to rest. It just seemed you could come to terms with it then. Most people recall how awful it was. Of the funeral of her son at Aldershot Military Cemetery, one mother said, I bought a grey coat. It was cold. It was an overcast day. There were thousands of people there. I just felt it was as though, like living a dream. I felt absolutely numb, as though you weren't really there. You were outside it all. The rationale for the military cemetery overseas had been to democratise death in service, and now something of that state control began to be weakened. Soldiers came to be seen not just as servants of the crown and country, but as individual men who had chosen to join up, and as individual men with families who loved them. The Falklands, therefore, stood on a bridging post from the Second World War to the present day. The conflict had evoked memories of World War II, but the living memory of the, Second, of the World Wars was starting to erode. Thus, in the 1980s, Britain started to remake itself as a nation, and in that remaking, remembering military service, as opposed to allowing it to be forgotten, became more important. So, turning now to the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think what we all associate with military death in Iraq and Afghanistan is the sombre procession of hearses through um, Wooden Bassett, renamed Royal Wooden, ba was Wooden Bassett, an acknowledgement of the part that the town played in memorialization. Symbolically, these repatriation ceremonies were very important. However, in some ways, they were a small part of the process of remembrance overall. 179 British service personnel were killed in Iraq, and 453 in Afghanistan. The deadliest years were in 2009 and 2010, when 108 and 103 service personnel were killed in Afghanistan. And the heaviest loss of life in Iraq was in 2003, when 53 service personnel were killed. The practice of crowds lining the roads in Wootton Bassett began in 2007, quite spontaneously, after three members of the British Legion spotted a cortege and asked the airfield subsequently to notify them. One time, the passage coincided with a bell ringing practice at the local church, and the practice evolved of tolling the bells for the dead. It became front page news in 2009, as eight hearses passed through, carrying the bodies of eight soldiers killed in Helmand, five of them killed rescuing comrades from a roadside bomb when the second device exploded. And actually, this photograph is, is quite harrowing. Uh, as you can see, um, one man pushed through the crowds to tie a rose to the rack of his brother's hearse and hammered on the window, and the crowd started to clap. Repatriation was now the government's prior agreed policy, meaning that bodies of the dead would be brought home shortly after they were killed. Family members were invited to greet the arrival of the plane, and a lot of work goes into making these ceremonies as, uh, as, as good as they can be in the awful circumstances. One mother said, it was awful. We were on plastic chairs on the runway. To know that your son's body is coming off that plane, 
it was awful. Another said simply, it was the worst day of my life. The bodies were then relocated to local undertakers. One man, whose son was killed in Iraq in 2003, remembered that he had not been told that his son's body was coming back to Yorkshire. He only knew when the local undertakers told, rang him. Families were given the option of visiting at the undertakers or taking their sons home. Some chose to have open coffins so that they could care for their sons. One said his sister did his hair with hair gel and they could speak to them and their friends could come to say goodbye. So I want to emphasise three things. Firstly, the crowds lining the route in pictures like this have been described as anti-war but I don't think that gives the, the whole picture. Military families were prominent in the campaign for a public inquiry into the Iraq War. In 2004, Reginald Keyes, the father of Royal Military Policeman Lance Corporal Tom Keyes, killed by a mob in Basra in 2003, and Rose Gentle, the mother, mother of Fusilier Gordon Gentle, killed by a roadside bomb in Basra in 2004, created military families against the war, specifically to campaign for a public inquiry into the reasons for going into Iraq. They were motivated by reports that the so-called 45-minute claim that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction that could hit British strategic targets in 45 minutes had been, to use the infamous phrase, sexed up, and by the fact that no weapons of mass destruction had been found. Reginald Keyes stood against Tony Blair in his Sedgefield seat in the 2005 general election, and Rose Gentle stood against Armed Forces Minister Adam Ingram in East Kilbride. Gentle said at the time that the revelation that Attorney General Lord Goldsmith had changed his advice to say that the war was lawful without any obvious reason for the change meant that the military orders were unlawful and the war was illegal. And the pressure brought by military families against the war eventually led Gordon Brown to agree to establish a public inquiry under Sir John Chilcott, which reported in 2016. And here is a photo of uh, Rose uh, with her memorial bench to her son in the front garden of her house. And a photo of Reg on the memorial bench in his garden. So these photos were taken by Stuart Griffiths, who I'm working with as part of the project on this. And so the second point, although they protested the politics of the Iraq war and wanted the government, especially Tony Blair, to be held to account, the parents I've spoken to are not anti-military. People respect the armed services in which their sons fought. Um, one father, who also said he was a Jeremy Corbyn supporter, admired the collective culture of the army. He said they all looked out for each other and they wanted to help others to the point of being willing to lay down their lives. Another mother, whose son was killed in Afghanistan, said it brought her consolation to know that he had died doing a job he loved and doing his duty. Another mother said her son had believed in what he was doing in Afghanistan. He believed the British army was there to develop the country and improve people's lives and she was so proud of him. And in some ways, I think the gradual revelations about the weapons of mass destruction and the eventual withdrawal from, from Afghanistan were more painful because people had believed in what their sons were doing. Reg Key said that finding out that there were no weapons of mass destruction and the manner in which his son has died, which, was initially con which had initially been concealed from him, he said it hurt so much. And thirdly, and this is moving to my conclusion, the remembrance of the military dead seen at Wooten Bassett was shaped by the traditions of war commemoration begun in the First World War and reinforced in the Second. That the individual dead who fought for Britain should be named, that mourning their lives should be recognised and that British civilisation should be defended. But it also represented a transformation in those traditions, driven, I think, by social change. As the voices of military families have been heard more, as military service has become much more unusual and as deference to authority has receded. Those transformations in commemoration were also driven by the politics of Iraq and Afghanistan, which the legacies of which undermined centre-left internationalism and galvanised distrust in government. The people who lined the streets at Wooten Bassett 
often supported and respected the armed services, but strongly criticised the government who had sent them to conflict in the first place. Further, people's feelings about losing a son or a husband or a brother, and they still are nearly all men. There have been three women were killed in, um, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they are still uh, nearly all men, and seem to be similar through time. Uh, Val O'Neill, whose son, Corporal Chris O'Neill, was a medic killed by a roadside bomb in Basra in 2007, said that grief was like entering a parallel universe. It resembled real life, but you could never get back to how it had been. She said her joy and her ease with living had gone, and she would give anything to see him again one more time. And this is a photo of her memorial in her front room. Grief, therefore was still intensely private and personal, but the public response to those deaths had changed, although that didn't necessarily mean the public had developed a language for talking about grief. People still said that people crossed the street to avoid having to say anything to them. Nevertheless, from the stoicism that was encouraged during the Second World War, there's now a greater expectation that emotion could and should be expressed. So in that sense then, military death reappeared, and private forms of remembrance proliferated. This was no more the tidy and ordered cemetery in a far-off land controlled by the state. Rather, traces of the dead appeared in public gardens and parks, private homes and gardens, in street names and civilian cemeteries. So, um, this is a photo of uh, Memorial Bench uh, in Batley. You can see it positioned by the the, the local war memorial still emphasises the kind of connection between and the importance of the connection between uh, local communities and, uh, and war remembrance. And that's a photo of the grave in Allerton Cemetery in Liverpool of Lance Corporal Peter Eustace of two rifles killed by an IED in Helmand in 2011. Actually, the anniversary of his death is today. And this is a copy of the street sign uh, to mark the street named after Private James Prosser of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, killed in Helmand in 2009. Um, this is the National Memorial Walk in the town centre in Sunderland, where people can buy uh, stones to remember anyone who served in the armed forces. It was set up by a former paratrooper whose paratrooper son, Private Nathan Cuthbertson, was killed by a suicide bomber in Helmand in 2008. So as they came home, the responsibility to remember their names increased. Perhaps in a more secular society, maybe remembrance is the afterlife of the dead. One mother said that she felt guilty that she was alive and her son was not. The families want to keep the names of the dead alive. They want people to know what their children did. And these photos are from the National Memorial Arboretum in uh, Staffordshire, where the names of all those service personnel who died in British military campaigns after 1945 are listed. The photos are from the annual Ride to the Wall, when bikers, veterans, families and supporters from all over the country converge over at the Arboretum and, and take over this space of, of remembrance. It illustrates, I think, the strength of a remembrance culture that comes from the bottom up, those connected to the armed services or sympathetic to them. And it's positioned as a reaction to the perception that otherwise recent conflicts would be forgotten. So this reappearance and domestication of the military dead illustrates the diminishment of Britain's world power compared to the period of the world wars. But it also augments at least in some political circles, the importance of tradition, because British involvement in the world wars is largely regarded as a positive in British national life, and also because um, support for the armed forces has now sometimes become seen as a test of patriotism. So what this shows, I think, is the end of the living, the end of the living memory of the world wars. Remembrance Day now remembers the dead of all post-1945 conflicts, and there's no longer a collective memory of the hardships and the realities of violence brought by war, and no longer a presumption that everyone remembers because they or their parents lived through it. 
The Second World War is still very prevalent in national memory, but its meanings have become fragmented and distilled. And in that dissipation, arguably, Britain has been reshaped only under that shadow. And that's the end. Thank you so much, uh, Helen, for that uh, moving and powerful uh, uh, lecture. Um, I'd like to uh, open the opportunity to our audience for questions. Uh, John. With a very, excuse me, with a very significant um, loss of life among British service personnel, um, and I just wonder whether whether you think that has also shaped how memory uh, is is directed, let's say, um, in this in this post-war era, or is it actually a special case? Now, that is a very good question, and I'm kind of glad it's the first question, because I am completely aware that that's a glaring absence uh, in, the, in the work that I've done so far. Um, and the question of, is it important in the memorialisation, that is a very, very interesting question. Um, so obviously, soldiers who died in Northern Ireland are on home soil. Um, which makes a difference to, to the way in which the bodies uh, are, are dealt with. And obviously also it's a period in which there's not a great deal of public attention drawn to those deaths. I often wondered when I was doing the work on the Falklands um, how families who, who's, who's, who, whose soldier relatives were killed in Northern Ireland must have felt about the Falklands because all of a sudden there's all of this kind of public attention and recognition and the South Atlantic Fund which raises a large amount of money for service families and none of that um, is there for, for, for Northern Ireland families. Um, I think there's actually a similar kind of um, feeling that, that y y sort of not exactly the same as military families against the war but there are military families in Northern Ireland who don't want British troops to be in, in Northern Ireland. So I think you get that kind of, you know, bring the troops home uh, sort of feeling, this isn't worth our sons' lives. Um, and I think, I think it probably contributes, I think it probably does contribute to that sort of general sense of disappearance of, uh, of death. Um, so John Major, when he was Prime Minister, uh, had a conversation with... Uh, I think it was the Chief of General Staff, where he said, uh, uh, should he write to the families uh, of, of people who were killed in, in the Gulf War? And the Chief of General Staff said, well, no, because are you going to write to all of the families of, of soldiers killed in, uh, in Northern Ireland? So it's a period when they, they, they don't want that kind of regular ceremony, um, I think. I mean, I, I need to look into it, into it more, and I need to also sort of think about how and whether it changes across the entire period uh, that British forces are, um, are serving in, in Northern Ireland, because obviously you're absolutely right, it's the, it's the biggest single loss of life in the post-1945 period. Um, actually, I was going to ask a question about the Prime Minister writing letters uh, to um, families. Um, obviously, there was the infamous incident with Gordon Brown um, and one particular letter. Um, I can't remember whether the soldier had been in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, but actually, when which sort of brought that element to 
wider public attention. If John Major didn't do it for the Gulf War, when did it actually start? That is also a good question. So people think that Mrs. I'm glad you've asked it because it gives me the chance to say this. People think that Mrs. Thatcher wrote to the family's uh, condolence letters because it's in the film, The Iron Lady, uh, but she didn't. <laughs> and I think, you know, that, that's just because that it was, it was not the policy. It was not the thing that the, 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 the Prime Ministers did. I, I think it, I don't know exactly when it starts, I think, but I, I, I think it's only in, in during Iraq and Afghanistan that it becomes, um, but what I don't know, um, I know that Gordon Brown did do it, I don't know whether Tony Blair did it, uh, I, I, maybe he did, um, but it's, it's only sort of, and I think it's like one of the things, you know, the reading out of the names of the dead in the House of Commons, I think it's one of the things that sort of illustrates this quite big change um, during those campaigns specifically um, in, in the way in which people start to think about, about military death. That was fantastic, Helen. Um, just as in our boys, you're telling a social history of Britain alongside the social history of memorialisation of death in the military. And I was um, thinking about what you said about the 1980s when you said that um, the returning dead from the Falklands was part of a remaking of Britain. Mm -hmm. And clearly you're talking about phases of remaking, aren't you? And I just wondered what it is about the overall phases. And it's something to do with a wider acceptance of expressions of grief or of emotion about mass movements that the British seem to allow themselves in a post-war generation. And I wonder if it's something generational that you're talking about. And thus, Iraq and Afghanistan are a different generation to 1982, as 82 is a different generation to mm -hmm. Malaya, and Korea, because it seems to me that the dead coming back from those two world wars would have families who were brought up in an entirely different tradition of expressions of grief, which probably um, vaulted privacy in the home or in a community or in a regiment, whereas later families wouldn't have felt that, because Britain becomes more democratised and also more disparate, and it's not so centred on um, uh, some kind of abeyance to either a regiment or a state. Yeah, uh, that's the question really, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, that is the question. Um, I think that one of the things that's really different in the Falklands War is the press. And that is obviously reflects kind of social change as well. But the way in which the press, particularly the tabloid press, take up stories about grieving Falklands widow or mother uh, who you can't afford to go to the hospital to tend her wounded son uh, after, they, after they've come home. Um, that's just something that wouldn't have happened previously because there wouldn't have been that kind of public interest in the travails of ordinary people. Um, and so I think that, that that which itself reflects a sort of a greater democratisation and listening to the voices of ordinary people uh, is, is one quite quite big factor. I think taking what women say more seriously is also a big factor, although there's a sort of bit of a reaction against that as well. But the fact that they're kind of willing to listen to mothers and wives um, who wouldn't have been so much in the same way, at least, in the earlier period, I think is important. Um, and I think, I think this is much more pronounced only really during uh, Iraq and Afghanistan is this kind of expectation of, of talking about feelings. Uh, so there's a real shift from that kind of culture of stoicism, a culture of kind of repression of feeling and um, uh, uh, just getting on with it and not allowing other people to, to see your sort of private things that has to be, you know, you have to keep a kind of public face uh, um, to repress that kind of pain and hardship, um, whereas to move to a much more sort of open culture in many ways, where people are, are more expected and encouraged to kind of to talk about how they feel and are less expected to repress it. But it doesn't mean that everything has changed. It doesn't sort of you don't move into a kind of a perfect environment for talking about emotions. There's still a lot of of stigma, um, attached. and I think that. You know, from what I can gather, I think that grief is really, really difficult uh, 
for people to, to deal with, to talk about, and for other for people who are not in that position to kind of to uh, to accommodate. Uh, because I think it's it's such a big, especially if perhaps the loss of a child is such a, a sort of a huge transformation for people. It's, it's it's very very hard to kind of to articulate that. So I do think that a lot of these kind of changes in memorialization are driven by wider social changes. But actually that's been quite consistent. I mean, Thomas Leclerc says that, you know, during the First World War, the memorialization is driven by, by, so by, by civil society. So in a way, it's kind of the whole pattern has been um, that society is kind of driving the, the way in which the, the different conflicts are, are, are memorialized. So, hi, um, Helen, thank you very much indeed. Um, really great lecture. Um, I suppose part of the thing is, um, as you say, grief is very personal. And one of the things that struck me was that there are certain accounts there, there might be regional or national variations. So um, uh, the book Dead Men, written by Toby Honden, talks about the fact that in the Welsh Guards, officers who tended not to be Welsh um, dealt with grief in different ways from their NCOs and uh, their troops who tended to be Welsh. That there was often, you know, sometimes uh, Welsh funerals were more demonstrative than English ones. Yeah. Um, I suppose the second one is sometimes it's the the element of how people commemorate, you know, commemorate the dead. So there were, yeah, there was the famous story of the um, the Afghan sol the, 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 the um, soldier uh, who was killed in Afghanistan, and one of his blokes turned up in drag, um, actually dressed as a schoolgirl, and they'd actually had a bet or they had a wager that said that if one of us gets killed. The other one turns up at the funeral dressed like this. So in a way, it was a um, a typical. Yeah, well, it's the kind of warped humour that soldiers have. Obviously, at one point, been one. Um, but it's just that that's you know that sometimes you know, how do people deal with those differences, yeah. which can often be based not just on different parts of the country, but also soldiers and or service personnel generally and civilians. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think that there are differences, and they might be regional, and they might be partly be class-based as well. Um, so I've actually yet to interview family members of any officers who who were killed, um, and I, I don't know whether there, there's a, a difference within the services, sort of based on officers and other and, and other ranks. Uh, but I do think that there are, are different um, mourning practices, it, partly in different regions and partly class-based. And I'm quite interested in the practice of having an open coffin, because I think that that was, that was very common in, in England um, in an earlier period. I think it's, it's kind of rooted in, in working class culture. I think it was very widely done. But I think sort of from the 1950s onwards, it, it became less and less widespread, sort of as society kind of became more, more middle class, uh, or sort of adopted more middle class um, habits. Um, so uh, 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 there's a kind of there's a sort of connection somewhere in some minds between sort of respectability and and hygiene and the sort of the treatment of the bodies in that sense. But uh, like, I think it's quite heartening that the, the kind of the practice of open coffins is still is still there, is still practiced uh, in in different kind of communities in, in in England still. So yes, I think there are variations. Um, there may also sort of be variations based on religious practice as well, but I haven't been able to sort of establish that as yet, but I, I, it, that might be also there. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I just wonder if you've considered uh, um, the influence of the arrival of private military and security companies because suddenly in the most recent wars, these have been conspicuous actors. And how, how are, what are they called, operatives in these companies who get killed, mourned? Um, have, has any, because they are citizens of, you know, various countries and one would think they are more grievable and quite clearly the, the cash that pays for these services of these companies. Uh, is taxpayer cash. So shouldn't we mourn them as well? Interesting question. I don't know. 
is the is the short answer. Uh, it's not something that I've um, that I've looked into. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can elaborate. I'm thinking that you know that there are a number of so like so thinking about the British Army, there are a number of soldiers from places like Sierra Leone and Fiji um, who were killed in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, one of the things I'd be interested in thinking about is, is how their families kind of respond and react to these deaths um, and what repatriation means in those circumstances if the family doesn't reside in the, in the UK. And about private security companies, I, um, it would probably be even harder to look into it. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting point, thank you. Uh, hi, yeah, um, great lecture, thank you very much. Um, you, you referred a couple of times to campaigns where the Britons have been fighting alongside soldiers from other countries. So I just wondered to what extent you thought there was influence between countries in terms of memorialisation practices yeah. as we've increasingly become globalised and co-combatants. That is another very interesting question. So. In, in Korea, I think one of the interesting things here is that there is a divergence between Amer um, British and American cultures uh, with regard to the treatment of the dead. So in Korea, um, the, the, all the bodies are initially interred uh, in the sort of UN looked after territory, but then American bodies are, are repatriated. And the Imperial War Graves Commission at that time uh, they have a discussion about, about that uh, and they, they actually talk about whether they should move the British bodies um, into a cemetery in, um, in Japan uh, at that time, sort of as the American soldiers are being, are being repatriated back to America. But they very, very strongly take the view that um, they shouldn't, they should leave them in, in the UN cemetery in, in Korea because the argument was that if they move them uh, to Japan, then there's no real reason why they shouldn't bring them home. So if they were going to move them to another country, uh, why not bring them home? Because that's what the families want. So I think that um, British policy was very uh, strongly, sort of very, very strongly informed by that initial kind of the decisions that they took after, after the, the Great War, that, that, that they don't repatriate, that they continue this tradition. Those traditions are very, very strongly enforced. Which is why, um, you know, when Margaret Thatcher overturns that policy, I, I really strongly think another prime minister wouldn't have done that because the military weren't in favour of it at the time. Uh, so it's only because of her kind of um, her willingness to sort of to, to kick against that that particular tradition that that that, that happens. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and then that's an interesting sort of proposition. At what point it would have happened? Um, so um, yeah, to sort of to set it alongside. It is an interesting contrast, I think. I um, do need to look more into sort of Australia and New Zealand, how they, how they kind of deal with it. But it's, a, it's an interesting contrast with America um, there. Uh, and other sort of, yeah, it provides sort of other, other kind of quite interesting things to think about, I think. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, I have also a question. I'm uh, from the Netherlands and in uh, Holland we have a, a, a big American graveyard, it's called Mar Margraten. And all the American soldiers who died in Germany were brought to uh, Margraten in the Netherlands because you don't bury uh, soldiers in enemy, enemy's land uh, also after the war. So uh, after the war all the Americans were brought to the Netherlands. Uh, about uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, was there maybe a, a kind of thought that it would be an, uh, also a country of the enemies and you, uh, in the practical sense, you must bring uh, people back? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a good point, an interesting question. Um, they had decided Prior, at least in Britain, they had decided prior to the um, to the outbreak of the conflict that they would repatriate bodies. I don't know the extent to which that was driven by the the sort of 
the you know the inability subsequently to care for the bodies in overseas military military cemeteries. I mean that is obviously there as a consideration. But I think they bring bodies back after after sewers because of, for that for that reason, uh, or some bodies after sewers for that reason. Um, so like that's not overturning the tradition. It's just a kind of practical consideration. Um, we're going to bring the bodies home because we can't guarantee the security of the um, of the cemetery. Which, of course, itself is a sort of indication of Britain's changing world position um, from the world wars to the to the present. Um, behind there. Thank you. Um, uh, I just want to kind of um, draw on some of the themes that you spoke about about the. Uh, transition from maybe stoicism to more of a I don't know if you'd call it like expressionism or something um, without wanting to kind of delve into divisive political issues um, we all saw the, uh, the the tension that arose um, because of the proposition that there might have been protests at the at the cenotaph last weekend, um, and I just wondered if uh, this might reflect again maybe the the tension um, in British traditions on memorialization between stoicism and a more subjective expression of of grief, and whether you think we do have a continuing tension in that regard between maybe an older generation who are more inclined towards grieving in a um, a more stoic manner and a newer generation you think that who or might might be more inclined to believe that grief can be a subjective process and that um, it perhaps might not it it might be acceptable to to use grief as to use protest as an act of act of grief or act of remembrance. Yeah, Thanks. It's, it's a good question. It's a good question. I, and I do think that it's sort of um, in some ways the kind of the the it enhanced focus on emotion and on and on grief is one of the ways in which kind of remembering the armed services can become as if it's a test of patriotism. So that emotional expression can be made into a kind of, you know, how, are you patriotic? Do you support the armed services? Uh, uh, and, and therefore, you know, the, the opposite of that would be, well, if you don't support the armed services, um, you're not patriotic. So I think, I think that is one of the kind of political ways in which memorialization has changed. But I think it's probably a move from a more kind of collective remembrance um, in the sense that everybody, there was more of a, I think, there was more of a kind of collective view of what was being remembered um, after the World Wars, just simply because the experience was, was widespread. So, you know, not necessarily the experience of grief in the Second World War, but just the experience of participating in the Second World War was, uh, was, was, was widespread. So they don't really need to hammer home what is being remembered because it's obvious. Whereas nowadays, because look, there's so far fewer people serving the armed, armed forces, um, and you know of those, it's only a small proportion really who, who have the misfortune to be killed. So the experience of death in military service is it's quite an isolated experience. It's quite a sort of... Um, so there's a real danger, I guess, as some families say it, that they will be forgotten because it's not a widespread experience and that puts kind of an additional charge into, into we need to remember. Um, but I think that, that that need for remembrance, it can be politically positioned in different ways. Um, one of those ways is to make that kind of connection between emotion and patriotism, but there are other ways of doing it. Thank you, Helen. Um, so many thoughts. Um, 
maybe it is about numbers then, because if you think back to 1991 and the preparations that were made, the crematoria that were prepared, people's bodies were not going to be brought back to the UK. They were going to be cremated on the battlefield, if you think about military preparations. My question is about how we think about war and what the, gre the greater meaning is, is, is to think perhaps more about the more contemporary debates on moral injury, because we get more people back because of casualty evacuation. People survive even after really devastating injury. And how do we think about that as well? I mean, I don't want to overcomplicate what it is you're looking at, at, but it's it's remembering survival, it's remembering moral injury as well as death itself, isn't it? And our relationship between society and our responsibilities to those who serve yeah. and sacrifice for us, their mental health as well as, yeah. as, well as, as, as dying is, is quite interesting too. It is, it's a really, really good point. Um, so I think in some ways, it is about it is about numbers. I think you're right. I think the other thing I think is is a sort of a shift from an era where there's lots of people who are missing, presumed dead, to an era where nobody's missing, presumed dead. They know what's happened to people. Um, and one of the things that struck me, kind of looking at um, some of the material about Korea, is that they are still in that sort of missing, presumed dead. Um, territory, it takes time for them to retrieve the bodies, it takes time for them to identify the bodies. So there's families who, 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 don't, who don't know what's happened um, to, to, to their loved ones for, 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 you know, for, for a period of years, perhaps. Um, that isn't the case in the other conflicts. It, that, that sort of, and I think that does make a difference. And I think that sort of, I think that sort of missing, presumed dead, I think that that's one of the, the big things that goes into the memorialization of the world wars as well. Um, so, but when the death becomes more personalized, uh, when you can, you know what's happened to people. And, and I think it really enhances the responsibility that service personnel feel about the people who, who, who don't come home. Or, as you say, about the people who are, who are badly wounded uh, or whose lives are kind of otherwise transformed by the experience. So there is a question there about what does society owe to these people? Um, and I think that, that also does inform sort of some of these arguments about memorialization. So I know a veteran who I spoke to who, who see the, the sort of wooden Bassett phenomenon as being an expression of collective guilt um, on behalf of the population for having sent, <laughs> or on behalf of sort of collective guilt by uh, of politicians, perhaps even, for having sent soldiers into, into situations that ultimately Britain can't prevail in. Um, so the, it, it is, it's not a very easy question, um, but that kind of, that, that personalization and individualization of death, I think, is, is a really big <coughs> shift. So we kind of, we cling to the, the we still use the traditions, but, of, of memorialization from the world wars, but the context is really very radically different. Um, and that's, that's quite interesting. In some ways, that's the kind of, perhaps that's the nub of the problem. Again, thank you for a fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, I have a composite, not very good question. Composite meaning it's got lots of bits in it. Uh, and it has echoes in so many of the things that have been asked already and that you've already said. And I'll start with John's point about Northern Ireland. Uh, and, you know, in that case, is it that assistance to the civilian authority is a different kind of mission, a different kind of context, giving rise to the question, you know, is it about what the mission is? Uh, and you look at the controversies around Iraq uh, and, you know, people how people respond and that matter of grief is really a large part of was it worthwhile? What was the purpose? And those changing contexts and purposes maybe have a, a role to play in understanding uh, how things go. Some of the things you said about the attitude of Iraq is thinking, would it make a difference if I could go and explain nuances to people and they'd understand more than they seem to understand from, from the comments? 
Um, and you showed us pictures of Wales and Scotland. And, I, and, and earlier in the talk, you spoke about decolonisation, the, the kind of contemporary theme. Uh, uh, and also you've made reference to that kind of trope of uh, a field where there's ever a, forever a place that's England. Um, and that really makes me think, uh, in all of this, is there any sense of the union and differences within the union as well, decolonisation within a union context, mm -hmm. uh, because we know that many of those who go to serve come from the countries rather than from England, of course, there are lots from England, but then again from particular parts of England, and you, and you mentioned regionalism. So we've got all of these changing aspects and contexts and impact on the context and changes within it. Uh, and as a part of that context, kind of left field wild card, where does the Diana, Diana phenomenon fit into all of this? Was it a catalyst to some of the things that came, or was it part of a general pattern of change in the context that's been going on? Don't know what you can make of all of that. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> so I, I, I have been wondering a lot the extent to which it's the politics of the deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan that govern the forms of memorialisation. Um, it's, it, must have a, it must have a real bearing on, on it. It must have a real bearing on the way in which it plays out. Um, families certainly... It, you know, I, I suppose it is, it is harder to explain those deaths when, you know, what they... What they here is, well, there weren't any weapons of mass destruction and my son's tank wasn't fitted with the right safety equipment and uh, we withdrew from Afghanistan and the Taliban took power again. Uh, it does make people question what they were doing there in the first place in a way that wouldn't be true for the Falklands War. So I, it's, it's a very serious question. So if the politics have been different, if the outcomes have been different, would the memorialisation have been quite as impactful as I think it has been? Um, probably not. But those social changes would still have been there, so I think we still probably would have had repatriation at some stage, and perhaps partly for the, the reason given there. Is Britain doesn't have the world power to, uh, to maintain the, the, um, the, the overseas cemeteries. Uh, so I think there would have been a change, but whether it would have had the implications that... I think it has had. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I doubt it. Um, it would all look different, wouldn't it? <laughs> and as for, you're right. Scotland and Wales. So the question of how our end of empire plays out in different parts of the I union. It maybe relates to the, the question that that Geraint asked about sort of different commemorative practices in different in different regions. Um, I don't know. But I do find it very interesting that the places that I've been to visit relatives have been formerly industrial places, not all of them cities, uh, but there is still that kind of connection between former working class areas, industrial heartlands and armed service. That was there in the Falklands too. Um, so yeah, it's tracing, that, it's tracing the end of something, isn't it? It's tracing the end of something there. Uh, the end of that kind of link between um, industrial labour and ideas of nation as well. So it's all going in, into another kind of implication of, of your question. Yeah, it is, yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. Well... <laughs> gentlemen. Um, my goodness, uh, some excellent questions there and I think uh, lots more that we can uh, now uh, discuss over a drink. Uh, so uh, I'd like to thank our, our speaker uh, once again, Helen, for a fascinating, thought-provoking and moving uh, lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.